Okay, well, great. Uh, thanks for uh, having me today. This is a really exciting topic for me to talk about. Uh, 20 years ago, I was um, rollerblading and uh, going to work and then rollerblading and hanging out and playing volleyball at the beach. And I stopped one day and I read this book. It's by a biologist called R.D. Lawrence in Praise of Wolves. And uh, by the time I got to done, done with it, I was, I was set. I was going to focus on wolves for the rest of my life in some capacity or, or another. I wanted to do something bigger than myself and uh, get involved in an issue that I think is very important uh, for not just uh, North American continent, but the entire world, or at least the Northern Hemisphere, where wolves exist. And at that time, in the mid-90s, the, uh, the federal government thought so too, and so did a whole host of conservation groups. And so they released, uh, they embarked on the largest recovery project of an endangered species, the recovery of gray wolves into the Rocky Mountain states. They released 66 wolves into central Idaho and into Yellowstone National Park, and they set in motion a change of the landscape that would happen forever. I'm being told to get closer to the wolves. <laughs> so currently, uh, wolves were wiped out. At that, before that time, wolves were wiped out from the lower 48 states. There were only a couple hundred existing in, up in the upper Great Lakes region. And then by the time uh, we got to wolf, uh, wolf reintroduction in the mid-90s, we had about 200 left in the lower 48 states. That was about it. Now today, let's just fast forward till today, we've got about 3,500 in the upper Great Lakes. I don't know if I have a, we've got 3,500 in the upper Great Lakes. We've got about 1,500 or so in Yellowstone, Idaho, Montana, uh, Wyoming, and, and uh, uh, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. And then we've got about 110 in Oregon and Washington, uh, 85 or so in the, uh, in the Southwest. For me, when I started, I focused about the wolf itself. I was very excited. The book I showed you uh, was a focus on a wolf pack. It was a captive wolf pack, and the biologist spent a good part of a year studying that pack. And I wanted to do the same thing. I thought it was just the most exciting thing. So at that time, I got involved in a place called the California Wolf Center. I don't know if you can tell by the fashion of the day. Um, that's mid-'90s wolf fur. Uh, but uh, I wanted to study wolves. That's what I wanted to do. But as I got more into it, I realized it was more about just uh, the wolf itself, that there was a pack, and that pack had a lot of meaning, and that pack interacted with the environment, and was critical what was going to happen in the wild, and that our goal as an organization wasn't to be just to focus on bringing in and teaching people about wolves themselves, but to talk about how wolves interact in the environment and how they make change out there. And so wolves are a lot like people. I mean, sometimes you just have to get in the other wolf's face to figure life out. Communications happen. Wolves live in a very family-oriented environment. In fact, it's very similar. They, they go through marriage, they go through divorce, they raise kids, they have teenagers, the teenagers get in fights, the parents yell at them, they run away from home, they start their own family. So it's really exciting uh, to watch those changes happen. I had so many opportunities to do so. I also, as I started to study wolves in the wild, I started to understand how wolves like to travel too, just like we do. They, their ranges, their home ranges, though, are a little bit bigger. Uh, 50 to 1,000 square miles. Some wolves will disperse and leave the pack and travel up to 600 miles, and that's how we get wolves moving around. And they can run up to 40 miles per hour, and I'll show you some of that in, in a short bit. Well, what do wolves eat? And this is where we start getting into the important stuff. Wolves prey on large ungulates. Wolf, elk, excuse me, moose, elk, deer, caribou, and bison. They're not going to be successful all the time, but what they do is they create what's called a landscape of fear. By hunting, by testing their prey, they're causing change in the environment, and that's critical. Wolves may be successful 10, 20 percent of the time, but it's those continual hunts that make a difference. I don't know if you can read the caption, but it says, I know you missed the Wainwrights, Bobby, but they were weak, stupid people, and that's why we have other wolves and other large predators. Wolves cull out the weak, sick, diseased, old, and young. And by doing that, they leave the healthy behind to continue to breed and move on. So before wolves, when wolves were wiped out, before we returned wolves to Yellowstone, the picture on the left, uh, the environment was pretty much a mess. And again, this is, this is probably an early 90s photo. And uh, 
the grasses were overgrown in certain places, but the riverbanks were eroded. Elk, by way of one example, could just graze wherever they wanted. There was no predator that could chase down elk or bison, so they could just eat forever. After wolves, we see a dramatic change in the environment. We see the riverbanks come back, and that creates habitat for different species. Wolves also, when they make a kill, they put food on the ground for other species. It's been well documented that ravens follow wolves because wolves are going to put food on the ground. Bears follow wolves. Coyotes follow wolves. And sometimes even wolves follow the ravens because the ravens will say, hey, you know what, let's get out in front of this. Let's figure out where those ungulates are. Let's figure out where the food is. We're going to go hang out there. And the wolves will follow, follow the ravens as well. So what we have happen is the before picture on the left, the elk are just hanging out. It's real easy. It's kind of like a vacation. When we bring wolves back, everything starts to change. The, wolf, the elk stay on the move. Uh, the grasses grow back. It shades the river. It brings back certain fish. Uh, creates habitat for migrating songbirds. Uh, coyotes uh, and foxes have to deal with wolves, but they get some more food. Uh, the bears come back around. And the elk, as you can see, are off in the distance there. So it's a much more lively environment. So let's take a look at some of this in action. This is a pack of wolves in Yellowstone Park in 2005. Uh, one of the biologists on the Yellowstone Wolf Project, Dan Staler, took these photos from above. And the wolves were actually hanging out with this bison herd for quite some time. And then they got up and they started to move the bison around. And what they want to do is they want to test them. So they kind of want to move them around, keep testing them. They want to find out what the weaker elements are in the herd. And if you look at the bison, you can see their tails are kind of curled up. If you're in Yellowstone Park or somewhere where there's bison and their tails do that, you just need to leave. Uh, those bison are fairly strong. And in this instance, they drew a line in the snow, although that line's going the wrong way. Um, but the, it, this is a very uh, dramatic, punctuated photo showing how the wolves are basically stopping the hunt 100% of the time when bison and moose turn and face wolves they prevail. So if wolves are chasing you, turn and face them, you'll prevail. We can also look at uh, comparison with elk as well. And in this instance, um, we have some elk in the southwest. <coughs> Let's uh, see if we can get this video to work. OK, here we go. Um, so we've got elk in Yellowstone Park. And the wolves are starting to approach the elk. And this is going to create. Um, this, this keeps the elk on the move. This is they're actually doing it. But what I want you to watch is the elk's posture. It changes from just kind of mingling to two very distinct things. Besides the fact that they're running and that they're bunched together, uh, they do something called stodding, which is where all four legs go off the ground, and they raise their heads up. I'm going to let this wolf catch up here for a second. The wolf is probably going somewhere between 35 and 40 miles an hour. And the wolves will kind of stay at a certain range, a certain speed, and then they'll speed up really quickly when they find what they think is the weaker element. And you'll see certain elk will cut away, but they don't go after those elk. Their head are raised up. The heads are pointing towards the sky. And they're going to do that studying motion. They're going to walk with a gait. They're going to run with kind of a very confident move. And that's going to signal to the wolves. And this has evolved over thousands of years. That's going to signal to the wolves that don't come after us. You're going to get hurt. And wolves can get killed in this process. It's not easy. You can see the size difference right there. The pack could be, I think this pack might have been about uh, 10 or 11 at the time. Um, maybe three or four of the wolves will do the primary hunting. Uh, some of the other more juvenile wolves will just kind of hang out and run around and wait for the kill to be made. And so they may have zeroed in on that one. Uh, we'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> But what happens when they make the kill, what we've seen is we see all these other species come in and, uh, and, and feed off it and benefit. We've got some ravens here uh, in the foreground. Um, and then we've got the wolves. And we've got a bear pretty much sitting on the carcass saying, I'm taking this over. And it's, it's really been the documentation of bears and wolves. They were, the biologists were very concerned at first. They thought that when wolves were reintroduced, they would disrupt the ecosystem in a positive way, but also that the bears had been so used to not having wolves around that it would, it would be painful for them. It would be difficult for the bears to adjust because they're very sensitive. Uh, the bears have done great. And in fact, we see, again, we see wolves following bears and bears following wolves around. 
In this particular instance, I think we documented this wolf following this bear for quite some time. Um, this stuff doesn't take place in a few minutes. It takes place over the course of a day. Uh, we've watched, uh, sat there in Yellowstone watching a coyote follow a pack of wolves, one single coyote following a pack of wolves from a, you know, probably about a half mile distance. And they just stick with them because they know that's where food's gonna be. They're the only species, the wolves, that hunt in packs uh, and hunt those same, those large ungulates and so the other species can benefit from it. And wolves will chase off the coyotes quite a bit. So we have a relationship between the wolves and their prey that's very important. We have a relationship between wolves and other predators that's very important as well. And all of this is called the trophic cascade, and it's this cascading effect. As the wolves chase their prey, as the wolves make kills, changes happen in the ecosystem that wouldn't otherwise be there. I've heard some folks say in the political arena, well, it's just a wolf. Well, it's just a species that makes quite a bit of difference. And so for me over time, it was really fantastic to get involved in this project. When I started, I had no idea I'd be involved for 20 years, but I can say right now, I'm gonna be involved for the rest of my life. It's the greatest thing in the world. Uh, when I first told my parents in 1996, I said, yeah, I think I'm gonna quit being a lawyer. I'm gonna focus just on wolves. I don't think they've responded to that since. <laughs> I think their jaws dropped and they've stayed dropped for that whole time. But I, I kept my day job, um, uh, but this has been a great, uh, a great way to do work. And so in California on December 28th, 2011, uh, the first wolf returned to California after an 80 year absence wolf OR7. And I think what this is gonna do is set in motion that trophic cascade here in California. We're part of a stakeholder working group that's a diverse group of interest of uh, not just uh, biologists and wildlife conservationists and agency folks, but ranchers and hunters and uh, folks that live up in areas where wolves will recover, trying to figure this all out and how to make it work in California. And I think we've got quite an opportunity here because we've seen wolves recover in other states. We've seen the mistakes made, but we have a very, we have a very interesting and diverse state in many, in many aspects. And I think uh, we can do some pretty good things uh, with recovering wolves in this state. And so as I enjoy uh, the life of being involved in this project and the presence of wolves, uh, all I can think about is uh, how important this species is. And going back 20 years ago, uh, I really am glad I gave up the rollerblading. So <laughs> I haven't, haven't done much since, but I've done a lot of, a lot of work on this. So I'm really happy. I wanna just uh, uh, share a credit to uh, both uh, our education team at the California Wolf Center uh, who helped put uh, the presentation together and do a lot of good work, and then Landis Wildlife Films who shot that raw footage uh, by Landis. So thanks a lot, and I don't know if you want questions or how you wanna go. Thanks. <laughs>